today's scripture, we move along in the Gospel of Luke as this year's uh, lectionary takes us. We're all the way to the 19th chapter this morning. And since there's only, I think, 20-some chapters, let me check here. Yeah, 25, 24 chapters in the whole Gospel of Luke. It's kind of ironic that we're marching right along as Luke tells more of the stories of encounters, teachings, things like that, of Jesus' earthly ministry. It's ironic because very soon now, toward the end of the month of November, what's the next season in the church's year? Advent. Advent. So what's going to happen is, I mean, the longer Jesus lives, what's he really moving toward? The cross. So it's like we take a time out in about a month and we go to Jesus' birth stories and all that and then we'll get busy during Lent with the continuation of the journey toward the cross with a whole new set of of lectionary readings. Anyway, 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10. I think 10, yeah. Now, this is again a story of an encounter Jesus has and a way Jesus used the encounter to bring people to new understandings. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Zacchaeus was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was, what he looked like. But on account of the crowd, Zacchaeus could not because he was short in stature. So Zacchaeus ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. All who saw this happen began to grumble and said, Jesus has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house because he too, Zacchaeus, is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost. Here ends the reading of scripture. May God grant its meaning to our hearts and to our minds. There is so much that actually can be done with that story, not just in terms of a sermon, but all kinds of scholarly thought has been given to it and everything. So let's, let's at least do a little bit of biblical uh, inspection, if you will, about what these characters in the story mean. First of all, Zacchaeus. Now, he was, of course, a tax collector. But he wasn't just any tax collector. He was what? The chief tax collector. That means that he probably didn't really go out and do very much actual work collecting the taxes. But he had all his people that worked for him as tax collectors going out doing the hard work. And he got a cut of everything they got a cut of and and that. So he was rich. Those are the two things we're supposed to know of. Now. Those days aren't, weren't any different than these days. What did everybody think of a tax collector? Hmm? Favorite person? <laughs> no, not exactly. Now, we don't think we have tax collectors today, do we? We pretty much get the bills in the mail or online or whatever, and we find out how much we owe by filling out a form and, and that kind of stuff for our taxes. But still, Tax collectors in those days, uh, how many of you know how they had to do their job? It's it's really important. 
they had to go from house to house and they told the person how much they owed in taxes. Now, it was supposedly based on the apparent wealth of the person. If they had lots of acres of land and it had been a good year for the harvest and things like that and they had all their uh, you know, granaries filled and that kind of stuff, or if they were some kind of a merchant and they didn't have very much left in their store because they'd sold everything or something like that, they were going to pay more taxes than the person who had worked for somebody else and was barely making it along. That was the idea. But now, for whom were these taxes being collected? The Roman government. Yeah. They weren't being collected for the temple because they collected their own taxes. Okay? Are you getting to see this? They were taxed more than we are? But they were. Okay, so this is not a religious thing that these tax collectors did. It was a governmental thing. How fair were the Romans? Yeah, they were fair enough that nobody rebelled, but part of the way they were fair was they killed the people before they could rebel. They were not nice, and so nobody liked them, especially not when they were collecting taxes. So the people that went to be tax collectors had been empowered by the Roman government to use even centurions if they needed to, to collect the taxes or to protect them from the taxpayers. So these were persons with real power over people's pocketbook, okay? Even if you didn't have much, and they were notorious for not playing fair. Whatever they told you the tax was, that's what it was. Now, if their own record said, for instance, that, that you owed 500 denarii for taxes this year, they could go to you and say, no, you owe 1,000. And you'd never know the difference except that you had to pay the 1,000. What do you think they did with the extra 500 plus the legal cut they took of the first 500? Yeah, it went right to their pockets. Not a bad way of getting rich, is it? Hmm? You can lie and get paid for it. Oh, wait a minute. Never mind. Never mind. Uh, uh, but seriously, that's the tax collectors that the people mostly knew and knew of. They knew they were probably being cheated by them. Even if they hadn't been cheated, they didn't like them. Okay? That's who Zacchaeus was, except he was a chief tax collector, and he was a short guy. So you could tell short jokes about him, you, you could have, that's why the centurions were important for him, because if there weren't centurions, then he would have probably been knocked senseless by some taxpayer. But anyway, he's curious, isn't he? He wants to see this Jesus guy he's heard about. And he goes to some trouble. I, I don't know, a sycamore tree sometimes has got these big limbs that go all every which way and sometimes if they haven't been pruned well as they're getting older those limbs will be close to the ground but I imagine it was not an easy thing for him to climb up in that sycamore tree and get high enough to see over everybody's heads and see Jesus in fact he was so high that Jesus saw him he was right there <laughs> he was this he was his tax collector hanging from a tree you know it's sort of like Christmas with a weird ornament but anyway Jesus looks up at him. Now, if you'll remember, there's other stories of people who have made every effort they can to just touch Jesus' robe. Remember those stories? And just see him. And all kinds of good things have happened for those people. But now here is a tax collector. All he's doing is getting a better seat. And Jesus looks at him, and the amazing thing is, he said, come down. That's not so amazing. Because i got to stay at your house tonight. If Jesus was who the people were saying he was, for anyone to get to let him come into their house as a guest was the highest of high honors. Because everything was built in those days on who you were or who people said you were. It was definitely a class society. Not unlike what we have today, but still... 
Not just anybody could ask Jesus to come in and stay with him. So it was imagined by most of the people that one of the, the, the chief priests, or the, of course they weren't going to ask him, but those were the kind of people that ought to ask Jesus to come and stay. Or maybe the governor or something like that. A tax collector? In fact, he didn't ask Jesus to come in. Jesus invited himself, didn't he? So, you're one of the other people that's gathered to see Jesus. There had to be a number of them anyway. I don't know, it doesn't say a great crowd, but there were enough that the only way Zacchaeus could see, them, see him was to climb a tree, okay? So there were a bunch of people there. What was their reaction when Jesus said, hey, I'm going to stay with you tonight? They were really upset, weren't they? They were astounded. Why not me? Even I'm better than that tax collector. That's the implication, isn't it? He's going to stay with a, what was the word uh, translated? Sinner. He's a sinner. The implication is, I'm not. The implication is, he's a tax collector. I'm better than he is. Do you get that? And so what do we do? We demonize him, and we call him a sinner. Mm. That's Jesus stayed with him. Now, the next thing in the story, it, can, it seems to jump pretty far ahead, doesn't it? If you look at the verses real carefully, it appears that this next dialogue that's going on is actually in the tax collector's house. We can't be sure of that, but it's the tax collector is saying directly to Jesus, you know what? I'm going to take half of my great, great wealth, half. I'm going to give it to the poor. That was much more possible back in those days than it is today. Like if you have a whole bunch of money in stocks and bonds and stuff like that, you know, it takes a while to convert that into cash and you've got to fill out the tax things and everything like that. Most of the wealth back then was in things like grain or whatever or in clothing and stuff. So he was going to give half to the poor and he could do that just like that. And then he says even more, and if I have defrauded anyone, if I've cheated anyone, get this, I'll pay them back four times what I took from, from them. Now, we are to take it for granted that he's telling the truth in this story. There's nothing else in the story but that, okay? This guy, who had gotten rich from cheating people, and from getting other people to work for him to cheat people, and getting paid by the government, this rich guy is suddenly going to give half of what he has. Now, let's take it easy here. Let's say the guy has, let's say if in today's world he'd be a multi-billionaire. Okay? This, this is for, just for discussion. Let's say he's a multi-billionaire. He has like $6 billion worth of stuff. He's going to give away $3 billion to the poor. He has $3 billion left. So that was a magnanimous thing for him to do, half of all his wealth, but probably he wasn't going to be hurting too much after that. But, first of all, if I have defrauded anyone, he's at least admitting the possibility that that happened, isn't he? I'm going to give him back four times more than I stole from him. Four times. That's going to cost him. He's going to take that out of whatever he has left of his wealth. And the other thing that's not said in this story, but try to imagine this with me. How effective is he going to be as a tax collector after doing this stuff? I mean, suddenly, he's become a changed person, hasn't he? He is no longer this rich, careless, not caring anyway, tax collector person. He's going to be this generous person who's caring about the poor, who's caring about right and wrong, who's going to do justice even more than justice. The four times is way more than he had to do to pay back the people he'd stolen from. He's going to be a completely different person living in a different way from then on. There is no way Caesar's going to pay him to be a tax collector. 
I mean, you can't have a guy that everybody thinks of as a wonderful guy come up and say, why don't you pay taxes to Caesar? You got to be kind of afraid of him, don't you? You know, <laughs> something like that. So his whole life has changed. He's willing. He's willing to go through what it means for him to become this new person because, well, somehow he was convinced right like that of the truth of living in the way of Christ. Must have been something to have been in Christ's actual presence, don't you think? Then what's Jesus say about all this? He says, when the Son of Man comes, now this is important, whenever you hear the Son of Man, that's Jewish for the Messiah. You do realize that all these stories that we now call Christmas, and that's what they are, they're just stories, about the divinity of Jesus, about the divine origins of Jesus, that couldn't have been the Messiah. Because the Jewish Messiah was going to be a fully human person, born to human parents in the lineage of David, who was going to have the favor of God and once again restore the Jewish people to their place of authority and things, okay? So the son of man means the Messiah. When the Messiah comes, says Jesus, it's for the purpose of transforming lives. Hmm. Wow. Nobody had ever heard that before. It worked in this tax collector's example. Now, how many of you have ever been asked by another person, have you been saved? Have you? Have you really? Okay. Um, how would you describe in just words or short phrases your experience of having been asked that question? Have you been saved? Huh? Offended? Anybody else? What? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. What else? Did anybody say, uh, it's none of your business? Suspicious. Okay, suspicious of what's next. Because no matter what you say, they're going to say, no, you haven't. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Will Williman, I knew him at Yale Divinity School because he's, he's just as old as I am. Will Williman went on to become a very, very famous preacher and teacher, and he became the dean of the uh, Divinity School at Duke for a while. Uh, Methodist minister is what he had been in his professional life, and, and Will was from the South, so he was a really good storyteller, and he still had his a bit of an accent, okay? So you can imagine it was kind of fun to listen to Will when he preached and stuff. And he, he, he was the best guy ever at sneaking up a point. He, all of a sudden you realize, what did he just say? Because you're enjoying so much listening to that lilt in his voice. Well, he had this happen to him once. At least this is the story that Will told. A guy came up to him and said, were you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? And Will said, hmm, yes. Well, how do you know? How do you know? Well, he said, I still remember that this really scary-looking guy in a black robe came to where I was sitting with my parents and made me go up in front of the whole church, and he put water all over my head. And I learned later I'd been baptized. The guy just walked away in consternation. This famous guy doesn't get it, does he? Yeah, he did. Do you understand what Will told that guy? Do you understand? He couldn't talk about some special conversion experience. He had none. He couldn't talk about the minute he took Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He couldn't. He got baptized. 
And so for the rest of his life, he was living in the Christian community as a part of it. He was trying to tell this guy, hey, your formulaic stuff doesn't work. It doesn't happen that way all the time. Jesus' story here in Luke seems to say, oh, maybe it does. Maybe there is this transformative experience that you'll never forget. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? How many of you can't remember a time in your life where you didn't understand that you were a Christian? Where you didn't understand that you were a Christian? Can you ever remember a time in your life like that? Now, some of you may have decided, I'm not a Christian for a while. Or, I, I don't believe that most of the words that I hear are things like baloney and stuff, okay? But can you ever remember a time where you didn't just kind of assume that you were a Christian? See, there's the problem for us. That's the way it is for most of us, isn't it? We haven't been a tax collector. Climb, we haven't climbed in the sycamore tree. We haven't had Jesus surprise the heck out of us and say, I'm staying at your house tonight and be overcome by the meaning of that and realize we had to change our lives completely, have we? Mm -mm. So sometimes these people that come up to us and say, have you been saved? And we know they're looking for us to give them the day and time and what happened to us and how we were brought to our knees or how we went forward in a church service and laid the, laid the hands on us and we confessed our sins and all that stuff. If we don't have that, then what does salvation look like? What does it mean to be saved? I think we can take today's story and answer that. Do you think that you could, in your own words, because you want to, tell another person how different your life is because you are a Christian than what you imagine it would be like if you weren't. Think about that. Not because somebody comes up and makes you say it, but because you want to. My faith enables me to live in, in a way that I don't believe I could in any other way. It, it, it enables me to do this, this, and this, or I don't do this and this. I don't like the don't part, but sometimes that's part of what it is. But I understand the world. I understand persons. I understand myself in a way I wouldn't if it weren't for Christ. You think you could do that? Of course you can. But you never thought of doing it, did you? That's not our way, is it? We're still, as congregationalists, we're still those stuffy old New England people. Let me tell you, they aren't all old, but they're all stuffy. No kidding. That's who we are. As soon as we hear somebody ask us if we were saved, we're very suspicious of them. And we have the right to be in a lot of cases, let's face it. The trouble is, we're also defensive. We're also defensive because we haven't figured out our own way. And I mean it has to be our own way, not as congregationalists, as Christians, to tell a person what a difference it makes to have Christ in our life, to be living in the way of Christ. What it means about our outlook even toward death. What it means about love and what that really means for us. It doesn't mean just a nice kiss to those that, that we care about because they're our kids. All those kinds of things. We need, I believe, to be able to make some sort of an expression, not exactly like, but along the lines of Zacchaeus. You know? Because of this new faith I have, because of Christ, I'm going to give away half of what I have. And if I've cheated anybody, I'm going to go far beyond what the law requires of me. I'm going to give him back more than I owe them. 
Now, in Zacchaeus' life, simply put, I'm going to turn my life around. I'm going to go in a way I would have never gone except for Christ. That really is true for everyone sitting here. But we haven't taken the time to figure out for ourselves, in our own words, in our own lives, what a difference it does make. And you know who needs to know that more than anyone else? A person you haven't met yet. Someday you'll be asked, why do you do this? We're already being asked, how do you do this on Thursday night? How many of you have had somebody say, well, how are you paying for it? Do you take an offering at the meal? No. No. We're paying for it. Where do you find the money? <laughs> it comes. But they're asking us, why? Why are you doing this crazy thing? I can't imagine doing that. They're saying that. Do you understand that's what they're saying when they come to you and say, how can you do this? They're saying, parentheses, I can't imagine us doing it in our church. We need to be able to tell them how they can imagine it. We need to be able to have our own words, each of us, to tell the person we haven't met yet why we continue to proclaim ourselves to be of the family of Christ, a Christian. Those with ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Amen.